Uh, I, I would basically say that Proton NMR gives you four different kinds of information, and one of the key pieces of information is the number of peaks. So now we're going to go on to another type of information. The other type of information, the next type, is the chemical shift, where we are on the diagram here, um, our chemical shift. Or is that the best thing to go over here? Maybe it would be better to, uh, yeah, all right, we'll, we'll do the chemical shift. Um, so remember that in this experiment, we start with a low magnetic field, and we keep increasing the magnetic field um, continuously, and then we measure at what levels of the magnetic field we get absorptions. Now, one thing to keep in mind is all of these, uh, these uh, protons that are doing the absorption, they're surrounded by electrons, right? You know there's a bunch of electrons here, and it turns out that the electrons provide shielding from the magnetic field. Well, uh, before I forget, let, let's back up for a second. Uh, so I just wanted to emphasize, if two um, uh, hydrogens have different connectivity, they're definitely gonna give different peaks. They're definitely not equivalent. If they have the same connectivity, though, they're only probably equivalent. There's some, there are some advanced problems where things with the same connectivity can still give different peaks kind of like based RF on stereochemistry. Values. Pardon? Kind of like RF values, how if it has like the same RF, like two, you know like in lab when you do TLC plates? Right. If they have the same RF value, they could be equivalent, but not necessarily. Uh, I don't think it's the same exact thing, actually. Okay. Yeah, so actually, uh, I think this is a, um, so, in a way it's similar, but in a way it's different, I would say. Okay, so um, the, the point I wanted to make here was simply that, um, because in that case, yeah, in that case you're getting the same results even though um, there's a different structure. Whereas here, we might oh, have the, the same structure and different results. Oh. Okay, but that's a philosophical point. So anyway, the important thing here is sometimes there's some advanced uh, situations where you can have the same connectivity and things can still give you different peaks. Um, and you, you may actually see that in your quiz, but it's a little bit advanced and it's probably not the best use of our time right now, so I'm not gonna go into that. Uh, but I did want to, uh, to warn you that this only works most of the time. There are some situations where things can have the same connectivity and still be non-equivalent, but we're not gonna get into that. So, but in your notes, you should have the word probably here and the word definitely over here. Okay, but that's all we're gonna say about that for today. All right, so um, going back to the electrons, Electrons provide shielding from magnetic fields. We're not going to discuss why that is. We will just memorize that electrons provide shielding from magnetic fields. And we'll see what the consequence is. provide shielding from magnetic fields. So let's say you've got lots of electrons around you. If you've got lots of electrons around you, is it going to take a high magnetic field to get an absorption or a low magnetic field? Then we need a high magnetic field for the radio waves to be absorbed. Because if there was a low magnetic field, um, we could say, roughly speaking, with a low magnetic field, the nucleus wouldn't even notice the magnetic field because it would all be shielded by the electrons. Remember, the electrons are providing shielding from the magnetic field. So the magnetic field is, uh, roughly speaking, the magnetic field is not even going to have any impact unless it can kind of get through this shielding, putting it kind of crudely. So the more electrons you have, the bigger the magnetic field has to be to overcome that shielding. Right. The more electrons you have, the bigger the magnetic field has to be uh, to overcome uh, that shielding. On the other hand, if you have few electrons in your environment, then the absorption could occur at a low magnetic field. If there's not many electrons, um, then even a low magnetic field can have uh, the impact necessary to get this absorption. Now, we won't go into the details, but that's as much as we'll need to understand this concept. So if you're getting an absorption at high magnetic field, what types of protons would absorb at high magnetic field? Shielded or de-shielded? 
protons have to be shielded. The peaks that happen here are for protons that are in a shielded region. They're so shielded that they only absorb when the magnetic field is high. So another name for this region besides upfield is this is the shielded region. Shielded. Compounds that are shielded, shielded by what? Shielded by electrons. Compounds that are well shielded by electrons absorb on the right hand side here. Upfield, high magnetic field, low chemical shift. Remember again that um, high field corresponds to low shift. So that's a little confusing, but a low shift is a high field because the magnetic field increases to the right, but the convention is that the chemical shift increases to the left. Uh, because this is confusing, it's just good to have a nice copy of this in your notes. So what types of compounds uh, would absorb down here? Deshielded compounds. Uh, I just noticed as kind of a memory aid, D shielded starts with a D, and downfield starts with a D. So maybe that's a memory aid to remind us that this downfield left hand side here is the absorptions that are D shielded. Okay. So let's think about um, the absorptions we would get here. Well, first of all, how many peaks would we have? Yeah, two peaks. Now, which of the uh, so which of these hydrogens are have more electrons um, around them? A. A has more electrons. Yeah, I, I can see why you would think that. It turns out that the result is different. You're probably thinking the chlorine is pulling the electrons towards them, right? But what you should think is that the chlorine is pulling the electrons away from the hydrogens and towards itself. So any electrons that would normally be around these hydrogens have been pulled over to the chlorine over here. But this is so far away from the chlorine that the chlorine has very little effect on I it. I thought since chlorine has seven electrons ah. and it's closer to the right. Air, it's, you know. Right. That seems like a, pers uh, a perfectly reasonable uh, supposition. However, what's more important is the electrons that would normally be around the hydrogen in their bonds, say. Okay. That seems perfectly logical, but it turns out that... Uh, I said that last time, didn't I? It's perfectly logical, but it's not right. Well, anyway, some things are logical, but they, they don't work. So. so I think that um, the electrons that are most important here are the electrons that are in the close vicinity of the hydrogen. Say the electrons in these bonds here. Well, all of these electrons here are going to be being pulled towards the chlorine and away from the hydrogen over here. And apparently that's not nearly compensated by these extra lone pairs that the chlorine has. After all, the chlorine is keeping a very tight hold on these lone pairs. Even though it has all these lone pairs, they're not going to get very close to the hydrogen here. So the effect of the chlorine is to pull electrons away from the hydrogen. So the key thing is not that the chlorine has lone pairs, but that it's very electronegative. So the more like polar the bond is, the less, the lower the magnetic field you need to absorb. That's right. That, that's exactly right. It turns out that that's exactly right. The best way to put that, it turns out, is um, uh, it, uh, the more electronegative atoms there are around, the more deshielded you'll be. The, uh, so the thing to focus on is the electronegativity. Electronegative atoms deshield the protons that they're close to. Electronegative atoms deshield the protons that they're close to. which means they'll end up absorbing downfield. Since they're de-shielded, it doesn't take as big a magnetic field to get the absorption. OK. Um, and eventually, you just want to kind of have memorized, and, and without even having to think about it, things that are close to electronegative atoms are further to the left. Things close to electronegative atoms will be further to the left. You don't even have to think through the logic every time, because our main goal here is just to interpret the spectrum. OK. So. Let's say the chlorine, let's say you were comparing like the, let's say it was like Cl, CH2, CH2, CH2. Oh, oh, let me uh, catch up with you. All right, so say again. What, what, what are you doing? Cl, CH2, CH2, CH3. If you add another CH2. Right. When you're comparing the CH2 next to the CH3, since that one's closer to the Cl, is it still less? Yes. That's right. 
that's an excellent question. So let's go through both of these. Let's finish up with this for a second. So uh, let's see, we get something like, so uh, is this peak the A or the B peak? Uh, B, I mean A. This is B. A is the more D shielded, so it should be further to the left. And by the way, even though we haven't talked about it yet, you would expect this peak would be bigger because it's got three hydrogens behind it and this only has two. Okay, I'm not trying to get the exact right spectrum here. I'm just giving you a qualitative indication of what the spectrum would look like. Okay, so here we get the A and the B. And again, notice how we want to get in the habit of always lettering the compound and then lettering the peaks. 